Hi, my name is Abby Frick, and we're here in Newmarket at the spot where the old Swan House may have stood, um, interviewing Mrs. Stapleton about the life of Frances Hodgson Burnett. And I am Lauren Beauregard, and I'm going to be one of the interviewers. And we have Reagan Panther behind the camera. This is our guest, Mrs. Stapleton, um, who is a lifelong resident of Newmarket, Tennessee. Um, who has taken a special interest in studying Frances Hodgson Burnett and her life. So my first question for you is how did you find out about Frances Hodgson Burnett and what drew, her to, drew you to her originally? Well, I've lived here all my life and from the time I was a child I noticed the historic marker along the highway that tells about her. It has uh, been removed due to a car accident but we're hoping to have that put back up. But not much has been said about Frances in our community over the years. and. And when I first started uh, delving into the importance that she had in the world of literature, I became aware of uh, her importance as such a great author known all over the world, but she was not well known here in her hometown of Newmarket. Okay. Thank you. This is an historical landmark placed by the state of Tennessee. In a log cabin which stood here, Frances Eliza Hodgson newly from England with her family, spent the winter of 1865. She helped support her family with music lessons and also opened a select seminary for young people. Here she met Dr. Swan Burnett, whom she married in 1873. Also started the writing, which later made her famous. Girls, you might be interested to know, uh, Frances was born in England in November of 1849, and she came to America in 1865 at the end of the Civil War. And it was a very poor time here in our community. This was very remote and very rustic. Her cabin that she lived in that you have a picture of did not look like this house. This house has been built around what the cabin uh, actually was. We believe from, from the stories told in the community that the actual cabin may be located inside this home. But it's uh, interesting that the home is now owned by a school teacher who has a great interest in Francis. But as the sign says, in 1873, she married Swan Burnett. When she came here, her neighbors were the Burnett family. The father was a doctor. He had a son, Swan, who Francis and Swan were later married. And it's interesting that just 144 years ago this week, they were married here next door on the neighboring property that belonged to the Burnetts. We'll go back there and look at the barn where Mr. Barnett kept his mules that he rode um, around the community to doctor the sick folks and deliver babies. And we'll also look at the backyard where Frances gained a lot of inspiration for her future writing. All right, let's Thank go. You. you mentioned in one of the emails that Burnett liked to spend a lot of time in her backyard. What about the backyard made it so inspirational to her? Well, Frances grew up in England in a manufacturing town, and there were smokestacks everywhere. There was no blue skies like we have here, pretty green trees. It was all gray and gloomy, and the people there were overworked, underpaid. It was a very sad situation there. When she came to America, of course, it was sad here because this was very remote and very rustic. They had been used to a fine way of living with silver and lace tablecloths nice clothes and when they came here it was exactly the opposite so she enjoyed being outside this was such a change from her dreary english home that she spent much time and she mentions in her autobiography the one i knew best of all she mentions the hill um, she mentioned the indian corn uh, it, she says, and from a life where a growing green thing was a marvel and a mystery, so we know that they didn't have green things there like we're so blessed to have here in East Tennessee. They began a journey of two weeks, and they finally reached land, and they came by train here to Newmarket. So during her time here, back in the 1860s, there was nothing to do. The children had to play outside a lot. Uh, so she enjoyed the flowers and the greenery. She mentions uh, that she lived the story when she came here. So before she was imagining a story and writing about a story, and when she came here, she was actually living the adventure. She mentions that it being in a rustic log house, that it felt like Fenimore Cooper, but there were no Indians. She dreamed of Indians being one thing she mentioned is that she wondered how her relatives and friends back home would 
feel about her saying things that she had picked up from the local children, like, I reckon. That's a slang here for Appalachia that people in England would have no idea what she was talking about. But she did enjoy uh, climbing the hills, roving the forest. Back then, it was quite heavily forested here. She did uh, have her senses awakened, much like Mary Lennox in The Secret Garden had her senses awakened uh, in the garden, in the greenery, in the flowers. And I think you want to look a little bit. We have an unusual growing crocus here on the property. Yes, we that, do. That's mentioned in some of her writings. <laughs> I find this very interesting in Frances's autobiography. She says, it seemed as if she must always have lived with a vast clear space of blue above her with hundreds of miles of forest surrounding her with hills on every side with that view of a certain far off purple mountain behind which the sun set after it had painted each splendors in the sky. To get up at sunrise and go out into the exquisite freshness and scent of earth and leaves to wander through the green aisles of tall, broad-leaved, dew-wet Indian corn whose field sloped upward, as you can see here, behind the house to the chestnut tree, which stood just outside the rail fence one climbed over to on the other side of the hill, to climb the hill and wander into the woods where one gathered things and sniffed the air like some little wild animal to inhale the odor of warm pines and cedars and fresh damp mold and pungent aromatic things in the tall sage grass to stand, breathing it all in, one's whole being enveloped in the perfume and warm, fresh fragrance of it, one's face uplifted to the deep, pure blue and the tops of the pines swaying a little before it, to hear little sounds breaking the stillness when one felt it most lovely little sounds of birds conversing with each other, asking questions and answering them, and sometimes being sweetly petulant of sudden brief little chatters of squirrels, of lovely, langorious cawing of crows high above the treetops, of the warm sounding boom and drone of a bee near the ground. Strange as it may seem to do, to feel, to see, and to hear all this was some while not new to her. She was not a stranger here. She had been a stranger in the square. She's talking about in England where she lived. Yes. When she had lifted her face to the low hanging smoky clouds, talking to them, imploring them when they would make no response. I think that that kind of gives us a glimpse into her future writings how she was just so awestruck with the beauty of America. And she was just so awestruck about nature. Yes. Most of that is just what the outdoors looks like. Very beautiful. So our next question is, how did the transition from England to Newmarket affect Frances? I think she probably had a, a wide variety of feelings. She hated to leave her hometown. Her dog she had to give away to a friend. She left her other extended family and her friends behind. So I know she missed them and she wrote to them and when she was a little older, she did go back and visit them. When they came here, they had belongings packed in barrels on the ship. They had some of the finer things Mrs. Hodgson had packed. They had lace tablecloths, they had silver for the table, they had nice dresses and shoes and stockings. And when they came here, the children here were wearing clothes made out of flour sacks. Back then, people would get their flour and sugar in big sacks made of cotton. So the mothers made their dresses out of, out of those fabrics that were on the flour and the sugar sacks. And they didn't have fine shoes and, and stockings. So I'm sure they stood out among the local folks as really being somebody different. But the local folks really took them in and in Francis's autobiography and in her son's uh, biography of his mother, they mentioned the kindness of the community and how Mrs. Hodgson and the two sisters would have starved to death during their first winter if it hadn't been for the local folks coming and bringing them bacon, eggs, flour. So they were well taken care of by the people here. And that's one thing that's continued to this day. This community is always very good to help newcomers or someone who is down and out or someone who's had a tragedy. So that still uh, is something that you'll find here today. Now. There are distinct differences. I don't know how they uh, related to the people. I know that Frances and her sisters had a little school here at one time to teach children. They had no school. She even gave music lessons. She was quite musical. So I believe that the community really looked up to this uh, new family. They probably had never seen anyone from another country before. So it was a learning experience for all of them, I'm sure. Thank you. 
Did Burnett's socioeconomic status or cultural background influence any of her relationships here? Well, I'd say that it was a little hindrance at first. The Burnett family, as we've mentioned, were her neighbors, and Swan had sisters, so I'm sure that they were playmates. Being 15 years of age, moving to a strange country, I'm sure had its challenges in itself. Besides being in 1865, it was the end of the Civil War. The children didn't have anything to do, so once a day they would walk over, across. Right now we have a highway there, but it wasn't here then, but they would walk on the other side of town when they would hear a train coming. If you've ever heard the train at Dollywood, you know what kind of train it was. It was a really old uh, wood, <laughs> wood fired uh, co a train. And so they would hear that from a great distance and they would walk over there and watch the train pass by. The children in the neighborhood did. So I'm sure she was welcomed into that circle because it mentioned the children of the neighborhood walked over every time they heard a train, which would probably have been once a day. So they could hear it and they had time to walk over so they could see the Civil War soldiers going home to both the North and the South in open air cars and what I have read, they, they talked to each other with the soldiers being in the train. Now here where we are in uh, the Burnett family barn, this is where Dr. Burnett, who was a physician, he had his mules here in the barn and Frances's first recollection of Swan was when she saw him in the street, which was a dirt street at that time wrestling with the mules for his father. Well, Francis really became acquainted with Dr. Burnett first because he had an extensive library. Here in Newmarket, no one had a library back then, but he was a doctor, so he had some of the classics, and so Francis would borrow his books. On the way over here, on the ship over here, she met a man who was coming to uh, Canada to teach a literature class. So he had a lot of the classics with him. So she had a long conversation with him every day on the ship about the books, and she was able to read all of his books. She was an avid reader. So she did have some access to books. But uh, one lady that we called in her later years was a Miss Caldwell that she was friends with, and they, are, they were a local well-known family. When Francis and Swan were living in Knoxville, they had their first child, Lyle. And then they had uh, Vivian after they were over in France. They had gone to France because Swan wanted to further his eye and ear training over there in medical school. So when they were in Knoxville, they had to have sort of a nanny or someone to help Francis with Lionel. So they, they were able to hire a lady who had been a former slave here in Newmarket on a farm out close to Cherokee Lake. So she was in Knoxville with them, and when they went overseas, she went with them. And from what I've read, she caused quite a stir because a lot of people had never seen someone of color uh, um, there. And so uh, she does have a little bit of a dictated uh, memoir, a short one-page memoir that I have, that tells about her time with Francis and Swan. While they were over there, Francis and Swan had their second child, Vivian, who was little Lord Fauntleroy in that book. He was the, the model for little Lord Fauntleroy. So when they came back home and they were almost penniless when they came back to Newmarket from being in France. They lived with Swan's parents for a while, Francis and the boys did, while Swan went to Washington, D.C. to establish his medical practice. So Francis was here in Newmarket again for a period of time with her boys. Then the boys would come back to Newmarket often and spend time with their grandparents. Did the family have any lasting impact on the local community? Yes, I think they did. First of all, Francis with her books, of course, uh, a lot of folks here are still unfamiliar with Francis, but every time I ask if they have ever heard of Francis Hudson Burnett, most folks will say no, but I'll say, have you ever heard of The Secret Garden? Oh yes, that was my favorite book. So then it opens the door for me to tell them about Francis and the time that she spent here. Also, the Burnett name is a Carson Newman name because Swan's cousin, Jesse Burnett, was a Greek professor at Carson Newman, and he later became president of Carson Newman. So, Although there are no local descendants of Francis's family, we had a celebration a couple of years ago for the 150th anniversary of Francis coming to America and living in Newmarket, and Francis's great-granddaughter and her daughter and her daughter came to town, and we had some programs at Carson Newman in the local area to celebrate that event. So there are some touches now. Uh, Penny Dupree is Francis's great-granddaughter, and that was her third time being in the community. She
she's been Carson Newman and she's been able to explore the local area. We had some programming in Knoxville. We went to the graveside of Francis's mother, Eliza. It's in the Old Gray Cemetery. Uh, Eliza was very sick on the voyage to America and she was never the same after she came to America. She died before Francis was married and it's a sad thing she didn't get to see the wedding. But she was able to bring her family here and to have a new way of life in America. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to meet with us today and for being a part of our documentary. Thank you. Tennessee County Clerk's Office with Mr. Frank Herndon, who is our county clerk, and he has the original record where Francis and Swan picked up their marriage uh, license or their certificate to get married in September of 1874. He also has Davy Crockett's marriage license here. Yeah. 